Hi guys, and welcome to the Silo AI Academy webinar series. My name is Kai Mikael Björk. I'm the head of research here. And um, we are keeping this webinar series in order to democratize AI and to inspire to interesting discussions and talks. This webinar series is now a recurrent event once a month. And if you want to have more information, please go to our community Slack channel. They will be posted there, both information about the events and also the uh, uh, video of this event afterwards. Um, today we will talk about uh, model interpretability. And it's uh, Ellen at the meeting who is going to talk about this. Uh, interesting topic. It's been more and more focused on interpretability models because uh, uh, business people want to know what AI is doing under the hood. And um, this is also a recent research track here in Silo. So please, Ellen, Dimitri, the floor is yours. Sure. And by the way, if you have some questions, just raise a hand uh, in your uh, GoToWebinar application by pushing the button on your left page, and then we will know that you have a question, so we can give you the right to uh, ask the question. And please do interrupt us whenever you feel like that. Go ahead. Thank you. Yours. Thank you for the introduction. So, hello everybody. My name is Dmitry. I'm an AI scientist here at Silo AI. And I'm focusing on computer vision and general general machine learning. And here is my colleague, Caroline. Uh, hello, my name is Eileen, and my position at Silo is uh, the data privacy expert, but I'm also part of the machine learning team. Uh, so, I will start the talk now, if you're all set. Yeah, uh, I will talk about AI model interpretability. What are the uh, common techniques to, that we can use today to interpret AI models? And what, why do we need to interpret AI models? And how we st started this discussion at Silo? And why it was very important for us to explore these techniques? So uh, I will first start by uh, explaining you how we started this discussion. Sorry, there is a second. Okay, so okay, so uh, how we started this discussion was basically when we when at Silo when we looked at the GDPR implications of AI. One crucial article was that uh, in the existence of automated decision making, you must provide information on the logic involved to that decision. So. Uh, imagine you're making some decision uh, about someone, so, uh, something important about that person's life, and this person is most probably not technical, and you need to be able to explain why your model uh, came up with particular prediction for that person's case. So in this case, the challenge we have is the complexity of AI models. Um, and how we tackle this problem is that we use some model interpretability techniques. And uh, so what does actually the law means by explaining the logic behind? I think we can understand two things from here. The first is that um, we might need to explain how actually ML model works to these people uh, who, who are going to, uh, th that the decisions were made on them, uh, something significant about their life. But most importantly, this doesn't, uh, but this might not make much sense because uh, the, the people uh, who are concerned by AI decisions might not be technical, or most probably they wouldn't have any interest in the topic, or uh, they would find it boring, or so on. Uh, we think that when we we should explain these people the factors behind the decision. So if we if we think uh, uh, an example, for example, that I have a model, I have a neural network which came up with the uh, prediction that this woman will not like Brussels sprouts, but this man will like Belgian beers. So basically, what I need to explain is that why my model came up with this this prediction. So uh, when we try to explain the reasons behind predictions uh, so when we when we look at the so we, we see there is a there is an uh, inverse relationship between interpretability and accuracy so the simplest models are more interpretable models whereas when the models get more complex the interpretability gets lower and it's 
it becomes a challenge, but the results get more accurate. That's why nowadays we are mostly using more complex models. So it's hard to explain complex models. It's a challenge. So when we look at the techniques that we can use to explain uh, explain uh, machine learning model predictions, we can kind of classify them into these four groups. The first group is the perturbation-based models. Uh, these models work with the most intuitive idea. What you do is that you take part of the inputs uh, or you take one feature, you occlude that feature. You replace that feature's value with a, a reference value or you re remove it and then you observe in the, the change in the output. So you make a change in the input and you observe the change in the output. But these uh, these methods are, uh, you need to basically, uh, you, you need to you need to basically uh, do this for many different orderings to get something accurate. So they're they're very potentially expensive. And the second uh, the second group group of techniques are grading based techniques. So the grading so this would apply to the neural networks. So grading based techniques basically uh, what you do is that you take the neural networks uh, uh, output function and you take the gradient of that with respect to the input variables. And uh, the third group is the relevant score base group. Uh, we, we like there, there, there. Some techniques call it relevant score. Some techniques call it important score. What you do is that you take the um, model output and then you try to decompose that output to the to all the neurons. You do it by layer by layer. You take the output. You go back layer by layer on your network and you decompose the relevance to each neuron until you reach all the input neurons. So all the input, all the input neurons, like uh, pixels in an image case, would have some relevance score. Uh, and then there are the att attention-based uh, models as well, uh, another class. So I'm gonna start by talking about, uh, so one, one technique that we use at Silo mostly was SHAP. Uh, so when we look at the SHAP paper, SHAP paper make a slightly different classification of these existing techniques uh, as the additive feature attribution method. So I'm going to explain why what this means. So I'm just I just want to let you know. So these four are uh, SHAP, Lime, Deep Lift, and LRP are some of the most common, most popular techniques that we use today to explain model predictions. So we see something in common in these techniques that they are all free additive feature attribution methods. What does that, that mean? So this means that we basically approximate our complex machine learning model into a linear function of binary variables. So what we do is what we do is something local. We don't do that for the whole model, but, but what we do, what we are concerned is that we just take one data point and then we approximate that data point output with a linear model. So what does that mean? So I take my complex model F and I, I'm going to approximate this on a linear model G and uh, on linear model G. And what I need, as I said, what I need to do two, two things here. So I'm going to use a linear model and I'm going to uh, simplify my inputs into binary variables. So what I do is I take my inputs and there is a mapping which helped me to simplify my inputs. This is most likely just creating some binary variables out of my input. So I take one data point and I look at the features there. If they are present, uh, I, 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 if, I, I just look at if they're present or if they're absent. So what I do is I fit the, these simplified inputs into a linear function and so I have this simplify inputs zero or one based on the existence of each feature for that data point. And I'm going to try to compute this impact for each future value. So what I am concerned here is that the output of the original complex model for that data point should match the output of my simplified my, my linear function, my explainable model. This is my only constraint that they should match. So 
uh, then I, uh, I what so yeah so uh, the mod the med models basically differ based on how they compute this impact uh, scores. So let's let's go uh, a bit detail in that. So what I care in this case, as I said, is that I want to have local accuracy. So this means that my explanation model G, where I'm just providing a local explanation, this one's output should match the original function's output for that particular data point. So uh, I'm gonna get these explanations for the, these factors will be the explanations for different features. So here, for example, as we as in a linear regression model we have the intercept so if i didn't have any information about my any of my input i would still know something because i have my intercept my intercept will be is as it is like will be just the mean of all the uh, all the predictions of my model so another another uh, attribute here is that uh, so as the simplified so, so simplified input represents basically if a future is present or absent. So if a future is not present, then the future, that future wouldn't have an impact score. So that future wouldn't have any importance on the output for that data point. And the third attribute is the consistency. So this basically means that imagine I have two models, F and F prime. So if if I imagine so. So I imagine that I have a set of features and uh, I have the simplified input for those set of features. So uh, Im I imagine that I have the, um, so, so basically the importance of these features uh, for this function F prime is this one. And then the importance of these features without the, the future I is this one. So. If there is such a relationship that the future i is more, so basically I, I have all the features here and I only don't have the future i here. So for this function, I can see that the future i is more important than the future i is here for this function. So if I remove future i he, from here, I have something bigger than if I re remove future i from this second function f. So I should have, if this is the case, I should have the consistent behavior in the computation in, in, of this uh, future attribution scores, phi i's. So in this case, the, the f prime, the, this, this future i should be more important for the function f prime than it is for the function f. So uh, the SHAP paper uh, shows us that the SHAP uh, additive explanations uh, technique is the only technique which complies with this attribute, whereas the other, the others only these these other others only comply with the first two, but they are failing in consistency sometimes. So what are these? Uh, what is SHAP technique? What are uh, how? Where did it generate from? So SHAP techniques come from this. Um, concept from a uh, cooperative game theory. So uh, Chaplet values were was introduced by Lloyd Chaplet, who was a Nobel Prize winner in uh, economics. And um, with Chaplet values, imagine you have cooperative game with Chaplet value, you can basically distribute the total payoff to the players in a cooperative game. So basically, the payoff of each player in a cooperative cooperative game is representing the importance of each player in that game. So we take this. In, I mean, in Sharp paper, they take this idea and they apply it into a machine learning context. So they they take they they say that so we can we can think the features as the players in a cooperative game. So what we do, what they do with uh, Sharp values is that they uh, what, they basically compute the average marginal contribution of a feature value over all possible corporations coalitions. So if we look at the formula and try to understand the intuition behind it, so this is like the the Shapley value, and I define it with a value function. So um, the, if I, I I say that the f is 
the set of all my futures and S is the coalitions, the possible coalitions which could be made uh, with these futures. So uh, if I have the value function, so if I look at the values of the coalitions when I have the future I there in the coalition and when I don't have the future I there in the coalition, I look at the difference of this coalition's values for all the possible orderings, because orderings will matter in this case. So this is very computationally expensive because you need to look at the order or all the orderings. So what Sharp paper does is that they try to approximate this Shapley values by viewing the contribution of features, like by considering them as the conditional expectation of the original model. So, uh, as I said, the phi zero is just the expectation of my function, just like the mean. So if I didn't know anything about my features, this would be the, uh, the impact that I would get. So then I consider, um, I take the conditional expectations for different features, just consider one of them, just then consider two and consider three. But what I need to, so this is only shown for one ordering, but what I do is I do it for all the possible orderings and I take the average of these phi values. So then I get something like this, uh, uh, an explanation. So let's, let's look an, at an example. So here I was basically trying to uh, explain. Uh, so I, I took the League of Legends data set and I was trying to explain if someone's going to win the game or someone's going to lose the game. So this data set is very uh, straightforward to understand. That's why I chose it. So I here I have one guy that I predicted that this guy will win the game with 95%. And here I have one guy I predicted that this guy will win the game by 3%. So he is losing the game. So here uh, I have the base value, which is the average uh, output. Uh, and I am what I'm doing is uh, I, I computed the Sharp values for all the features, and here I see the uh, features which have the highest magnitude, have the highest effect. So the red ones are the ones which are uh, making me to win the game. They're the positive Sharp values, and the uh, blue ones are the negative Sharp values which are making me to lose the game. So I see, I see that, for example, this guy earned a lot of gold, so he's, this is a reason for him to make him win the game. Whereas uh, this guy is like that I predicted that he's going to lose the game, earned very little gold compared to this guy. So then this is a reason for him to lose the game. So I can also look at this magic damage dealt. So this guy dealt a lot of damage per minute. Uh, this is a positive effect for him to win the game. Whereas for this, this guy dealt very little damage compared to this guy, and then this is a negative reason. So this is causing him to lose the game. So I can basically get individual explanations for all the data points I have, because I'm building individual explainable, explainable models for all my data points. So what are the available SHAP implementations? So uh, the, the first and the most simple one is the kernel SHAP. This one is the model agnostic one. So in this one, I don't need to actually know anything about my model. I just need to have some mapping which takes the output and give me, uh, sorry, which takes the inputs and which give me an output. Uh, so this is model agnostic could be applied to anything. And this is basically a combination of linear Lime plus Shapley values. So uh, as we discussed, Lime is a, additive feature attribution technique. So what it is concerned is that it fits a local interpretable model for one data point. And uh, so this actually in the Lime context, this interpretable model can be anything which is interpretable. It's, it could be a linear model, it could be decision tree, or it could be some other interpretable model. And the constraint that they have this uh, the interpretable model's output should match the uh, original complex model output only locally, but there is no such constraint globally. It should only match locally. 
So then I have another uh, I have another uh, application of shop, but 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 this one, this kernel shop, uh, as I showed, it's it's very computationally expensive. So I just take that that this linear function and fit the shop values into that, and I don't know anything about my model, so I cannot make any assumptions about my model to uh, to to ease the computation. So uh, in the tree shop, whereas this is this is particular for tree ensemble models, and this is available for uh, you, you can get explanations for your XGBoost, CatBoost, LightGBM, and some of the scikit-learn tree models. Uh, you can use it for those. And because now I know something about my model, they use the tree structure to simplify the computation. So they they uh, they decrease the computation. So they decrease the computation time from exponential time to polynomial time. So this is a huge improvement. And uh, now I can basically uh, provide local explanations for my whole data set. It will just take some seconds, actually. And uh, there is also some any other very nice trait, which is that I can compute the pairwise interaction effects, which means that I can look at the interaction effect for two features, like how those two features interaction would affect the SHAP values. And uh, I, I, I have some nice plots, uh, basically, to observe pairwise interactions. And uh, Sharp, Sharp, Sharp uh, authors uh, argue that this is the only technique where you can compute pairwise interaction values. Uh, and uh, we have the Deep Shop. Uh, this Deep Shop is only for neural networks because it uses the network structure. So uh, Deep, this uses the Deep Lift, which is a very popular technique, and uh, combines it with the Shapley values. And uh, what it the, the, what how deeply it works is that as we said it's it's this um, relevance uh, based technique. So what we do is that we take the output, and then we we try to decompose it uh, backwards on the network. But how deep lift does it? That deep deep lift picks a reference for the output value and reference for the e input values. So what you do is that when you go back in your network, you compute your contribution scores by looking at the amount of difference in the output which was caused by the, the difference from the, the reference the, from the neuron that you're considered. So, diff so, uh, so the amount of difference on the output, like how much, what, uh, sorry, how uh, my, the amount of uh, difference in my input uh, cause the amount of difference on the output. So I'm always comparing the difference with a reference point which was picked in advance. And uh, gradient shop uh, incorporates integrated gradients and smooth grad techniques uh, with Shapley values. And uh, these techniques are gradient based uh, techniques. And my colleague will uh, speak more about those techniques. So I will skip now. And um, here the idea is basically in these three applications of SHAP, I know something about the compositional nature of my models. So these this significantly improved the computational performance. Whereas I'm still incorporating them with Shapley values, which is the only uh, consistent technique. So I will have the consistency attribute with me. And uh, so what are the plots that I can get with SHAP? So uh, I, I anonymized this plot, so it might not be so clear, but uh, this is basically, I produced uh, explanations for 100 data points. And uh, this is just a 90 degree counterclockwise moved version of the individual plot. So I see here the SHAP effects. And when so in in the original in the original application, I can just move my cursor in my notebook. I can move my cursor and see what are these effects. But I can I can have a better bigger picture. And here I have another uh, another one which is uh, basically uh, telling me like for my different features how the variation of those future values are affecting 
the chef values of those features. So this, this plot makes sense for uh, numeric features. So let's say gold earned. So if I earn more gold, my gold earned value, feature values are higher than my chef values are positive. So this is contributing me to win the game. I can come up with such uh, interpretations. And um, I, there are the interaction plots as discussed. So maybe I will uh, just show this one for now. So here, let's say, uh, so, so let's say I have these features and uh, the, I can get this sharp interaction plot with the, with, where the diagonal is showing me the main interaction effect. So basically the main effect, basically the variation of my, how the variation of my feature A affects my shaft values. Uh, but off diagonal, I can see how the interaction of feature A and B are affecting my shaft values. So I can get plots like this, where I am uh, comparing two features. So where I can see something like where, where I'm earn, I earn more gold and I, the total damage del dealt is high, so I have a high shaft value. Uh, there's a question on the line. So Zen is asking, in terms of computation performance, is it implemented in the parallel currently? What, do you, what does he mean by the parallel? Um, I can give him the rights to ask. Uh, then I will unmute you so you can ask your question. Actually, um, we will discuss this in the end. If you want, we can. We have a, a slide about computational oh, okay. performance. We can. Uh, we can leave it there because there is a slide about that. Okay. So Maybe. we will come back to this question at that point. Okay. Yeah. You can go on. Okay. Yeah. There is a slide coming about that, and then so. Okay, so also like if you're if you're looking for sh such interaction effects, also it makes more sense if you do it for numeric features. But for example, I I took some uh, categorical features and I tried to plot it like that. Where here this is a numeric one and this is a categorical one. So this still tells me uh, something about the interaction effect. So I. Uh, I implemented this uh, these different shape applications for this image recognition problem. So I use this VGG16 uh, model, and uh, here these are the first three predictions of this model. So the first one is boxer, which 42%, and uh, yeah. So I, I will I will try to look at the explanations for boxer and tiger cat. So. Here, I, I'm basically computing sharp values for the three, the first three, uh, the first three classes. And um, so here I see that, okay, on the face, my, my model thinks that the face has a positive effect that this image was classified as boxer. And it's the same in the bull mastiff case. So remember that sharp values basically are just the sum of the, the probability. So the, they basically a composition of this sum. So if the probability of having a tiger cat is too low, so that the shaft values regarding that will be smaller, like almost 10 times smaller than this one. So in order to uh, scale it in a nicer way, I, I produced uh, plots on different scales. So in this one, I can see that um, I can see the effects for the tiger cat as well, whereas the, the shaft values now are like uh, 10 times slow, uh, slow, uh, lower almost than this one. So here for, for tiger cat, I can see that the face of the dog has a negative effect on this image to be classified as tiger cat, whereas the cat parts have a positive effect. So as I said, this was the uh, uh, this was the application where I don't have any assumption of, about my model, so it was too slow. So let's, let's uh, and I applied the gradient shaft uh, so I applied this uh, basically to explain the end of the fifth convolutional block. Uh, so here uh, are the explanations. So I have the, again the scaling problem. So I'm going to show this one uh, to see it better. So here I see that uh, the, the face of the dog is contributing positively, uh, that this image was classified dog and the 
cat parts are contributing negatively that this image was uh, classified as cat. And um, for the tiger cat uh, classification, for, for uh, this one, I see that the dog parts are, have ne negative contribution and cat parts have positive contribution. So then I looked at uh, another uh, layer. I looked at the end of con block three. So here I have something more detailed as expected. And these explanations are quite consistent, which what the explanations I got for con block five. So you can basically do this for any layer that you want on your network. So, uh, and uh, with deep shop, I get an expl pixel based explanations. So here I'm uh, here I am. Uh, I'm uh, getting. Uh, yeah, I, I, I see that the, the, the again the dog's face are contributing this to be a dog and cat parts are contributing to be a cat. So we also try to apply this for the NLP problem. Uh, I think it's not as good as it works in the uh, image case. So uh, here we get we get explanations for different words, but uh, we used word embeddings. So this this plot doesn't make much sense. So we built our own plot where we see the placement of the word, and then uh, we we try to understand uh, the interpretations if that they make sense. But I think for the NLP case, uh, we get some random errors when we use the deep shop. So uh, there, I, I, there might be some bugs in the code of the current implementation for this. And uh, now my colleague will talk about GradCam. Yeah, thanks, Erling. So I'll try to catch up from here and tell you about a couple more interesting techniques. And I'll actually start with my favorite, which is called GradCam. So that holds for gradient weighted class activation maps. And as the name suggests, it's a method which is basically based on gradients that you uh, propagate back through the network once the network is trained. And uh, this method is applicable uh, only to the architectures that have uh, this stack of convolutional layers at the beginning. So practically, uh, uh, that nails down to computer vision applications uh, and uh, natural language processing mostly. Uh, the authors in the paper uh, basically say that uh, it could be um, like any task, uh, regression, classification, um, image captioning, question answering. So basically, whatever comes after uh, the convolutional stack, like the tail of the network could be anything because uh, it just gets linearized. Uh, yeah, let's take a look at the method a little bit more in detail. So basically what um, what you want to know is the uh, relevance of the input um, pixels uh, in case of images with regards to a specific class. Uh, so you basically ask a question, which uh, um, pixels or features of the input uh, affect positively the specific class. Uh, so what you do first is you take a um, a derivative of the um, uh, basically vector that corresponds to your specific class and you zero out the rest of the like um, neurons at the output layer in case of classification task and we take it with respect to the um, um, activations at the last convolutional layer. In principle, you can do that uh, with respect to any convolutional layer that comes before that. But um, as we know, the like higher level features, uh, they are kind of learned and preserved at the uh, uh, towards the like tail of the of the network at the last convolutional layer. Uh, so probably you are more interested in that. Uh, but basically, then what you do is you take um, uh, you kind of this uh, gradients that correspond to 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 the last convolutional uh, stack of features at the last convolutional layers. They are a uh, global average pooled, uh, such that you get a weight uh, for each neuron at this uh, at this convolutional layer. Uh, and then what you do, you do a weighted summation of the activations when you forward propagate the network with uh, your example. Uh, image or an input, uh, 
you preserve the activations and you take away that some of your gradients uh, derived uh, weights and the activations that you that you get and then uh, it's important to do the uh, the relu such that basically you trim out the uh, the negative uh, the negative activations because they uh, as the author suggests they are mostly noisy and they kind of interfere with the other classes so in principle this is very straightforward and we applied it to our favorite image of cat and dog and as you see we get like quite consistent result. It's um, the same model architecture or the VGG16 model that we used in this case. Uh, maybe one, uh, like not the limitation, but a thing that you should keep in mind is that since the activations or the features at the last convolutional layers, they are down sampled with regards to the original like resolution of the image. So you need to kind of stretch your heat map and upscale it uh, back to be able to overlay with original like image, uh, which means that uh, you do not get precisely pixel-wise uh, relevance, but it's kind of a area area-based relevance. Uh, also, we tried uh, we did some experiments uh, by exploring uh, different uh, layers. So, as I said, you can take a derivative of your output with respect to like different convolutional layer. And as on a contrast with Sharp, uh, we saw that they basically did not make much sense, at least in those examples that, that we tried. So Sharp is probably kind of more consistent in that sense. All right, the next uh, method that is also based on the back propagation is called uh, LRP or the layer-wise relevance propagation. Uh, and in this case, what you do is, again, you do a single forward pa pass of the network to, to, to get a score for your class. Uh, and then uh, you start basically from the bottom. So your uh, relevance of your last layer or the neuron is basically a score. And what you do is uh, you iterate over layers backwards and uh, you calculate a relevance of each single neuron within this specific layer based on a specific rule. And these rules, they, uh, they differ depending on the type of the uh, layer uh, and also it, yeah, depending on what kind of architecture you have. So these are a few examples that I picked here from the paper. So the first one is a very basic rule. Uh, Mm, but then the author, authors also suggest that uh, if you have uh, like a closed interval or a layer, like for example, input images uh, are typically restricted to 0 to 225, um, like range. So you, you can apply a little bit different rule and then there is like the last equation is the expansion of, of, of the basic rule where you take into account not only the positive relevance but also the negative relevance. So this small example uh, on the bottom of the slide on the right shows that um, if you apply like this last rule, you can also see which uh, parts of the, of the drawing of the, uh, of the digit basically reduce the, the, the chances that the network will classify it as eight or, or four. Uh, all right. Yeah, this is LRP applied to, to, to the same image. Uh, here we use this investigate software which implemented LRP pretty nicely and they, I think, have different variations of these rules. And as you see, depending on the rule that you choose, uh, uh, you get quite different results. So I honestly do not really have an explanation why this bottom line actually looks pretty pretty random. Uh, so it doesn't, even though it provides like pixel level relevance, but it doesn't actually say much. Whereas the, the, the first uh, rule that I applied is it's quite nicely showing what is a cat and what is a dog and why. Okay. So this is yet another like distinct class of the models that uh, I personally also like. Uh, they are kind of different uh, from the rest of what we have shown in the sense that the attention mechanism is already 
kind of built in within the structure or within the architecture of the network. Uh, and you don't need to do any back propagation or anything. So once the network is trained, you do the forward path and you, uh, and you kind of already see uh, the, uh, the attention maps uh, or the relevance of your input features. So this is a, an example of uh, image captioning task. Uh, which uses uh, recurrent network, the LSTM. So what happens is that at each uh, step of the LSTM uh, samples a, a word. And once it does the sampling, it basically uh, kind of dynamically produces weights uh, that map uh, to the convolutional feature. So you kind of um, you can see what, what is the network focusing on when it, when it produces a word. And you do it iteratively until you get to, to the period. Uh, so these are a couple more good and, and not so good examples. So you can see that uh, actually this kind of approach can also help us to basically spot where and why the network goes wrong. And it's obviously quite uh, not a surprise that these two giraffes were like kind of messed up with a bird because yes, they look like a flying bird on I don't know in the yard, and yeah, and then the the, the print label was messed up with a clock. Uh, do I have something else? Uh, so maybe. Uh, the, there is basically a broad range of these different kind of attention and visual attention models. Um, you can broadly, maybe I would broadly split them into the uh, models that use uh, stochastic gradient descent to optimize and to train. Uh, and they are so-called uh, soft attention models. And then there are also uh, like models that are based on the reinforcement learning which uh, kind of do the random sampling of certain input, uh, like subset of input, uh, to be able to do the prediction. And these models are not typically differentiable, so you need to, to go for, for like reinforcement learning and all that stuff. Uh, yeah. This is the last example that I want to share because we are kind of getting short on time now. Uh, and in a sense, this is probably the most straightforward and intuitive way to do the interpretation of your predictions. So in this case, uh, the uh, task is to diagnose this plural infusion. It's the condition where a human gets uh, liquid in between like lung tissue and, and the pleura. Uh, so what happens here is that once the model is trained, what you do is you do multiple uh, forward propagations with the same input, but the input is not exactly the same. So what you do is you kind of perturb or um, you basically mask out certain regions in different ways and you see what is the probability of the class of interest. So the first row basically shows you that once this rectangular or the black uh, rectangle reaches the important area for the prediction, the probability of the class drops. Uh, in this way, you can basically identify what, what is the important or the crucial region of, of the image that, that is crucial for the prediction. The second row is basically kind of line kind of approach, uh, which is similar in the way, but you do the perturbation a little bit differently using super pixels and then you like sample a different subset of those super pixels to do the prediction. But in the end, the idea is, yeah, is the same. So the drawback of these methods is, uh, as Erwin already mentioned, that they are extremely computationally intensive because you need to do multiple forward propagations for a single example. And I think as the next slide, uh, maybe I'll first show this slide because it kind of sums up the the performance of the methods. Uh, so Erwin did some, yeah, this is nice, uh, some estimations for the calculations on the like regular MacBook Pro 13. I don't know what is exactly the like processor that is in this laptop, but anyhow, you see that uh, 
Uh, kernel shop is like by far the slowest uh, <laughs> competitor or approach because uh, as you've heard it, it uses like it tries to approach all these different combinations and uh, think of it um, like in this case we were using the uh, input si uh, images of size uh, 224 but 224 pixels kind of a toy example so if you are thinking of like large scale applications that's probably not the, the best choice so in that sense Gratcom and the other P was the kind of simplest and at the same time the fastest method to uh, to get still sensible and results that are still very much in line with what we saw at least on our experiments with other with the kernel sharp and the gradient sharp and deep sharp uh, okay maybe it's time to sum up so i think i've already did that to some extent mm. so don't go for perturbation methods uh if you need to do a lot of explanations for like entire data set because it will probably take forever uh, maybe I would suggest to start with the simpler methods like Quad Common or LP. Uh, you can implement them yourselves quite easily or use of the shop software, there is a lot. Uh, Erlin, maybe you want to add something here? Uh, like your, maybe your suggestions or. Uh, yeah, I, I think shop is nice in the sense that. Uh, it has many functionalities. So if you're using three models like XGBoost, like and yeah, sorry, uh, Cut Boost and maybe some of the three based scikit learn models, three shop is quite fast actually. So that's a very good choice. And um, we have been using shop at Silo and we get uh, good results, I would say. So maybe different we'll projects. So, for example, I, I would say maybe, like, for example, if you, if you uh, are using different model, you want to use kernel shop, but if you just need to explain one point, yeah. that's a good choice yeah. still, like, to use it. But if you need to provide explanations for all the data set, that's not a good choice. Yeah. Or you can maybe use at least on several examples shop and see that maybe some other methods is consistent. At least if you yeah, see the consistency exactly. in some small subset, then you can apply like one or the other for the rest. Exactly. Maybe I would do it like that. Exactly. And so exactly. And also the other techniques are for neural networks, but sharp it could basically be used for any anything. Yeah, that's true. So that's that's also nice. And uh, yeah. And in terms of learning how to use them, maybe we can comment. There are, uh, I think for example for sharp there are many available models. And for Lime mm -hmm. as well, I think Gradcam. There are many nice tutorials. Yes, and Gradcam is. Uh, I need to say it's like much more straightforward than the rest. Probably it's the easiest one. Our P might be something intermediate because uh, if you go for exotic architectures, you need to basically implement the rule yourself for your fancy layer. It might be straightforward, might be not. Yeah, yeah. We have and there are many specific. different implementations, and some yeah. of the implementations have bugs. That's also yeah. another issue. All right. But and we have, I think, we have one more yeah. kind of a general recap uh, of the topic. Uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> so basically, it doesn't matter whether uh, you outperform a human observer in a certain task or um, on the opposite, you are doing like pretty badly with your predictions. Um, still, you need to build trust. So um, you're always interested why. The prediction is what it is, but I think we have some questions coming. From yeah, the and I, I, think, I think it's good to also like emphasize that these techniques are very also very useful for the data scientists because sometimes something is going wrong and you don't know why. So you can use this mm -hmm. technique and then you, you see maybe you did something wrong in the pre-processing or like you, you can you can identify something basically by interpreting your predictions. That's a good way to end this presentation, but please, hey, stay here for, we have some questions online. Um, uh, please, uh, who is, it's uh, Ten who asking, I'm curious about applying the interpretation technique on the images that are designed 
to full, to full classifiers. Mm -hmm. Do you have any initial ideas on how the interpretation results can help to improve the classifiers? Do you have any answers on that? <laughs> That's a tough question. I, I, I haven't even thought of it. Good question, Chen. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's good because again, you can, you can basically maybe have an understanding that why that image is fooling that classifier. Like maybe you can, if you do, if you look at many images that you use to fool the classifier, you can see that where the classifier is looking at which is mm -hmm. wrong or something mm -hmm. like that. So you, you get a better understanding of your model. I would say, but I, I don't know how to improve your model with that. Okay, let's take the next question. Um, it's uh, Yotarun Lin who is asking, Hi, uh, do you think current method actually interpret anything? I mean, we still cannot adjust our model accordingly. Is that correct? I mean, by the learnings of your interpretations, basically you can adjust. Mm -hmm. So this is basically explanations on why your your model came up with certain solution, exactly. so certain certain prediction, and then as a human, you like, can change. as a scientist, you can change something in your model. Or you can change exactly. pre-processing or change something in your model. Yeah. Or maybe there is some very weird data point. Actually, it's like you can throw throw some part of yeah. that that away. Like maybe there. So, and, and actually, to me, this like model interpretation is more not about tweaking the model, but rather kind of tweaking your data to make sure that your data set is reliable, because this is also like a way to identify. If something goes wrong, typically it's not the model, but it's the data. Yeah. Yeah. At least in my experience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of the talk by Philip Kinter about the NLP also, and, and, and that the the lack of data uh, and, and training data in the NLP case when you want to make uh, text uh, from speech mm -hmm. uh, is is the, one of the bigger issues. So so it is somehow possible also to use model interpretation to kind of get some insights how um, say for you as a decision maker how you could improve. Uh, 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 so speech to text uh, with better training mm. data is that can you use it somehow in this case? I actually even saw some applications mm. of exactly then, this problem and, yeah. Yeah, that were addressed with this uh, model interpretability stuff. We didn't try anything like that, but there is already something. Oh, going on. Need there. to check. Yes. You have more questions here. Oh, thank you, Oliver. Great overview. Have you considered how to handle combination of multiple model modalities? You get tabular combined with images. That's a good one. Yeah. Do you have an idea on this? Could it could it be like what could be an application like the visual question answering or something? For or instance, you can ask him. We can unmute him and then, yeah, and and he can elaborate. There's that. probably some specific. Uh, yeah. Uh, problem yeah. or project exactly. that you're working on. So let's unmute him. Oliver. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Can you, can you hear me? Now we can hear you, Oliver. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so this is actually Anders uh, using Oliver's uh, laptop. Oliver oh. is here. Oh, <laughs> so thanks again for a great overview. I think that was really comprehensive and, and well presented. So uh, the application, um, you know, we, for example, have a weather forecasting model that makes use of both like tabular data from wind turbines, et cetera, and all like weather station combined with uh, satellite images. So it would be nice to be able to understand both um, how much or what part of certain images are used for a certain prediction, and also in combination trying to understand the features of the tabular data, mm. and potentially even try to see in an aggregated way how important is the tabular source of data in, in aggregate compared to the satellite data as a whole? Mm. Have you ever considered these type of you know, multiple modalities in a single model and, and how to work with the different type of interpretability uh, techniques that exists? Tough, good question, uh, but yeah. very relevant. Do you have any ideas? Well, maybe. Uh, I could share 
some experience that sounds quite relevant to what you have with that. Uh, you don't necessarily need to always uh, try to put everything into one model. Uh, say if um, you have like one model that works, say, with images, and another model which is trained only on the tabular data, uh, you might consider like putting the outputs of this model into like another classifier, which could be very simple linear regression or some kind of regression. And then uh, uh, you will be able to kind of uh, see which of, of, of the data sources or modalities kind of only contribute to the final prediction or the final uh, like output by getting simple coefficients like next to, to the specific predictor. Uh, if I understood correctly, like your question. Yeah, I mean, we sometimes do uh, compose the model into separate models, but it's rather nice to have an end-to-end -end model as well, mm -hmm. where we actually don't have a separate model for images and another one for tabular data. To actually have it learned um, to make prediction uh, in an end-to-end -end way has been proven rather useful in the past. Yeah. So I know this is a hard one to answer. Uh, I certainly don't know how to do it, but uh, it would be nice to hear if you have ever tried to actually do some interpretable understanding, understanding of these kind of multiple mm -hmm. modalities type of models. Exactly. It's also relevant because looking at our platform, combining images and tabular data in one model is one of the very unique areas where the platform actually performs really strongly. Thanks for that. Um, no. Uh, there's one more question, and uh, since the time is running out, I have to uh, uh, get this question, but we could have to answer it quite um, briefly. Uh, you started the talk mentioning interpretability for GDPR. How far are the methods you discussed away from being sufficient for satisfying the interpretability requirements of GDPR? This is a good question. Ellen, do you have any yeah, I, comments on this? I would say, I mean, I don't think most companies are even trying to interpret yeah. the models. So if one uses this, uh, I think they're very good for GDPR perspective. They're a very good approach. And I think the important thing is that the explanations should be simple. There, there should be a nice user interface that a non-technical person can understand uh, how to interpret those explanations when the person looks at, let's say, those shell plots can understand what it means. Uh, I think these techniques, if they're applied, they're really good for the GDPR purposes. It will help compliance. Will they be sufficient? But that's another issue. I would say if people can understand them, then they will be sufficient. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm looking at the time. Um, so I think we have to call it a day, at least for this webinar. I'm very really happy that you joined us. Um, we're going to have a video of this webinar also on our community Slack pages. And as I said, also information about upcoming uh, webinars. The topics will be also announced uh, well beforehand. But thank you, Dimitri and Eli, for this. Uh, it was a good overview, and, uh, and I also I want to thank all the audience for, for attending this and also making the questions. See you soon again. Bye from us. Have a good weekend.